privilege this morning to get to welcome uh, Doug Van Meter to our, our church. And so, uh, Doug, if you would uh, come join me here. Uh, Doug is, uh, has been with his wife, Jill, in South Africa for uh, 25 years. And uh, for 22 years, Doug has been the, the pastor teacher at Brackenhurst Baptist Church. Uh, Doug and his wife, Jill, have five just in, incredible daughters. Well, we were able to spend some time with them uh, last year and just... Uh, five wonderful young ladies. Uh, he has one son-in-law and uh, three grandchildren, uh, the youngest of whom will be born uh, in January, Lord willing, here, right? October. This kind of October. Even better, right? So uh, we're very, very uh, on, on tune with those dates here. Um, so uh, Doug is just a, a great, a great teacher. Um, very excited for him to be able to be with us. He's also an author. He, I got a copy of his latest book this morning, "The Promise to Live By," and you can uh, access uh, all of his works on Amazon. I encourage you to, to go and, and check those out and uh, get, get a copies of those. Uh, I would say one of the most valuable experiences of, of Whitney and my ministry and just kind of personal life was last year, just spending a week with Doug and, and his family. We were able to spend time with his, his precious church there and see uh, what, what 22 years of faithful ministry looks like. And we were just encouraged in our personal lives. We thought about how to, to parent, watching how Doug and Jill have, have parented uh, their uh, daughters. And then just encouraged, again, to see what faithful shepherding looked like. And so to have him here uh, at Bethany was just uh, an incredible privilege uh, to get to, to have that happen, and I'm so excited that he is able to, to share the word with us this morning. Uh, he's a dear friend, and uh, please join me in welcoming him this morning to, to our pulpit. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those kind words, but the privilege is really uh, all mine. It was a, a great joy last year to get to know Daniel and Whitney. I met, I met them two years ago when they came for a uh, Together for Adoption conference. And uh, when I heard Daniel, I said to my wife, I need to get that guy to our church for our annual missions conference. And uh, Daniel graciously agreed to come and came last year and spoke about uh, missions to the marginalized. And it was a great help to us as a church. Our church is is just getting into um, increasingly into orphan care, so it was great to have uh, Daniel with his expertise there to give us some help. And uh, it's it, a wonderful friendship's grown out of this. And I really thank the Lord for this weekend, spending time with Daniel and Whitney and their their children. It's been great. Um, my family, I have my, my one of my daughters is with me. Uh, the rest are back in South Africa, and they're just all terribly jealous that they're not here uh, with the Bennetts. I do pray for your church. I want you to know that. I pray for the Bennetts, and I pray for your church often. I thank the Lord for what he's doing here and look forward to the years ahead as uh, you're faithful uh, to the gospel. I want to preach today about the gospel from Matthew chapter 1. I want to preach the gospel, and I want to preach about the centrality of the gospel and preach on the promise to live by. I um, Some years ago, in a Christmas morning message, we... In South Africa, we, we, it's very traditional to have a Christmas Day service. Almost all the churches do that. And it's a great opportunity to preach the gospel. A lot of visitors come that day, the, what they call submarine Protestants. They surface at Easter and Christmas. Um, and uh, so I preached from Matthew 121 that morning. And I really couldn't get away from it. So I went back and spent about two months just preaching on Matthew 121. Uh, and out of that came a series, The Promise to Live By. And I want to I give you the heart of this passage today. In verse 21 is what we're going to spend most of our time in. But understanding the context of this and the circumstances around this. And just to encourage us in, in the gospel. And I'll say much about that as um, we begin. So if you join me in Matthew chapter 1, I want to read the first verse and then jump down to verse 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then, of course, he then gives the human genealogy of Jesus. And he comes down to verse 17 and sums it all up in a triad of 14 generations. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. 
and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. So he's gone from the genealogies to the actual birth of Christ. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, and you can just imagine the turmoil that's going through his, his mind, through his heart, as he's thinking about this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, your, to, to, to take, to, to, take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for <clears throat> Emmanuel. Thank you that God with us leads to God is for us. And we thank you for the gospel. And today, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us as the scriptures are expounded. Lord, to appreciate all that you've done for us in your son. Equip us today. Uh, thrill us today in the gospel. Encourage believers today and save the lost. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The message of the Bible from cover to cover is, is basically this. You are a sinner and you need a Savior. That addresses the universal problem of man. You are a sinner and there is a Savior is the universal proclamation that we as the church are called to take into all the world. And as believers, though, we would say this, that we are sinners and we do have the Savior. That is the, the believer's universal promise. And it is to be the promise to live by, that Jesus indeed will save us from our sins. Tim Keller has written that the gospel all too often is seen as the ABCs of the Christian life. It is seen as merely the foundation of the Christian life. But he went on to say that actually the gospel should be seen as the A to the Z of the Christian life, the A to the Z of the Christian life. Because the gospel, we never outgrow the gospel. You never grow deeper than the gospel. That the gospel is what every day we are to be preaching to ourselves, reminding ourselves of, and, and preaching to one another. I had an introduction to this, this theme back in the late 1980s when uh, I lived in Australia with my wife and at that time two very, very small daughters. We were ministering there in, in the city of Brisbane. And I one day met with a, a man by the name of Graham Goldsworthy who's written some wonderful books on biblical theology. And as I sat in this man's massive study lined with all these books, I knew I was in the presence of genius. He's a, he's a brilliant man, but a very, very humble man. And I asked Dr. Goldsworthy, I said, when you, you preach out, obviously you preach different places, what kind of things do you preach? And he looked at me kind of quizzically and he said, well, young man, I preach the gospel. And I said to him, well, I understand that, but what do you do when you preach to, to, to places where it's just believers? And he said, young man, I preach the gospel. And he went on and he pointed me to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, where Paul talks about the gospel of God that is concerning his son, Jesus Christ. And he explained to me, back then as a young man, he explained to me that you never outgrow the gospel, that there's nothing deeper than the gospel, that everything in our life is about the gospel. So even though we're not always being evangelistic, perhaps, in a sermon, primarily, we're always focusing on the gospel. That the gospel is the good news of what God has done for believing sinners in Christ Jesus, in his life, in his death, and through his resurrection. And the good news of that good news is the, is, is the promise that we are to live by. And we first find this promise in the opening pages of the New Testament, 
in this Matthew chapter 1, when Joseph has learned that Mary is expecting and he knows he's not the father. And so he's assuming that she has been unfaithful. And the Lord graciously sends an angel of the Lord to give him the gospel and to give him the message that, go ahead, Joseph, and take to you Mary as your wife, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And he says, Joseph, when, she, when he is born, you are to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What, he, what the angel was saying was, Joseph, here is the gospel, here, here is the gospel, and this is what you are to live by. And as we'll see at the end of the message, the gospel made a difference of how Joseph faced difficult circumstances. And I simply want to say as I begin this this morning, that this gospel promise that Jesus will save his people from their sins, there's nothing deeper than that in the Bible. And that that is to shape our worldview, that is to shape our perspective day in and day out. And so as we look at this, I trust that we'll be encouraged about this promise to live by. There's several things that I want to share with you this morning. And first of all is the context of this promise. The context of this promise that you'll call his name Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. The context is verses 1 to 17. And really think about it this way. The context is failure and faithfulness. It's the failure of man and the faithfulness of God. He gives the genealogy in these first 17 verses. And it's a genealogy of human beings who are sinners. They're in the human genealogy of Jesus. As you go through this, you see the greats of Abraham and of David. You see great kings and many of the kings and famous people that we know from the Old Testament. And though, though there are many people here who did a lot of good things, you, th you see Hezekiah. The fact of the matter is none of them could give to Israel what they needed, which is one who would save them from their sins. They all failed. He speaks about Jesus being the son of David, and, da and, 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 and David was a great king, but he failed. He's the son of Abraham, and Abraham was a great man, but he was a sinner. But in the midst of all this failure, you do have the faithfulness of God. This, uh, he was the son of David, and he's the one who's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant. God was faithful to fulfill that. God is faithful to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. In spite of all the failures in history, God is going to bring the salvation of his people to pass through his son. When Joseph named Jesus, Jesus was a common name in those days. The Old Testament name would be Joshua, and it means Jehovah saves. And, Je and Joshua was a great leader of the past, but he failed. But this one will succeed. I simply want to make this point. That the context of this promise is this. The gospel of God is the promise to live by because God is faithful to his word. Even though we fail, God is faithful. And we need that reminder as Christians because we will fail as Christians. And when we fail as Christians, we need to return to the gospel and to find great comfort and great encouragement that God will save us from our sins. But secondly, the circumstances of the promise. The gospel promise always comes to us in a particular providential context. If anybody needed to hear good news at this point, it was Joseph. Here was Joseph who loved Mary. And Joseph was planning on that wedding day and consummating the marriage and being husband and wife with the, the dear woman that he loved. But one day he finds out that Mary is expecting a child. And no doubt it was Mary who told him that. And it's quite clear he didn't believe that. You can hardly blame him when she says that uh, I, th this child I have is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph was an honorable man. And he didn't want to shame her, to put her to unnecessary shame. So he was going to divorce her, which he could do in terms of Old Testament law. He was going to divorce her. And he wanted to do it secretly. He didn't want to make a, a big public spectacle of Mary. He's heart sore. He, he, he's, 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 he's confused, I'm sure. And, he, and he's feeling very, very hopeless. But at that time, the Lord sends a messenger with this wonderful good news, with this gospel that Jesus, she's carrying Jesus, who's going to save his people from their sins. And this gospel perspective changed his perspective. I simply want to say this. That all of us in this room that are saved, God brought that gospel promise to us in a particular historical providential context. 
He brought us to the end of ourselves. He brought us to a point of hopelessness. And then he showed us the Lord Jesus Christ. For me, it was the 11th of February, 1980. I was a first-year student at Miami University in Ohio. And I had gone to university with great promise in many areas, and all those areas fell to pieces. And I remember spending days uh, very depressed and, 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 and in tears, actually. And all of that was because of sin in my life. And, and I felt the conviction of sin. I was raised in a Christian home and raised in a good church. But I hadn't, though I would professed Christ, I never really embraced Christ. And God knew just with the right timing. And God brought me to the end of myself. When one night, that night, I cried out to the Lord, please save me. And he saved me from my sins. The gospel comes to us. God knows when it needs to come to us at the right time. There's a context to this. There's circumstances to this. And as believers, I simply want to encourage us again that when we are in a situation where we feel like we have failed and we come to a point of hopelessness, it's at those times that once again we must proclaim the gospel to ourselves and remind us that Jesus forgives us and remind us that he will save us from our sins. One of my elders sent me an email uh, late last week and distraught because he'd failed one of the church members. And he was deeply disturbed by that and felt like such a failure. And he just said, I just feel like I need to quit. And I wrote him back and I said, welcome to the eldership. I've been there. I failed people as well. I said, but this is not the time to quit. This is the time to preach the gospel to yourself. This is the time to remember that Jesus does save us from our sins that he forgives us and he can change us and we can improve and we can do a better job. We need to proclaim this gospel over and over to ourselves. Sometimes what appears to be the, the worst of news is in fact the prelude to the best of news. It certainly was for Joseph. But finally, the character of the promise. The character of the promise. This wonderful promise that comes to, to Joseph in verse 21. That he, that, that, that she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This gospel promise empowered Joseph to face the circumstances in a fallen world to the glory of God. Fundamentally, the gospel promise is the promise to solve our biggest problem. And when we realize that Jesus will save us from our biggest problem, everything else is put in perspective. And we realize that he will save us from our sins. I want to meditate for some moments on the largeness of this promise. First of all, this promise is exhaustive. This is, there, there's no greater promise in the Bible than Matthew 121, for he will save his people from their sins. There's no greater promise than that. It's exhaustive, though. It deals with our past and our present. It deals with our future. It, the, the gospel promise that he will save us from our sins is a holistic promise. He will make us completely whole. He will make us completely well. It's the promise that he will save us from, first of all, the penalty of our sins. Jesus said one time to the disciples in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, we are to fear God, and the amazing thing about the gospel is this, is that the very one that we need to be saved from is the one who saves us. Isn't that glorious? We're, we need to be saved from our sins, yes, but fundamentally we need to be saved from the wrath of God. And the good news is that God provides a way to save us from himself. We should never minimize that. John Stott once wrote that divine love triumphed over divine wrath through divine self-sacrifice. That's the glory of the gospel. Jesus saves us from the penalty of our sins. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but he also saves us from the power and from the practice of our sins. Those who have truly been delivered from the penalty of their sins, those who have been truly justified, have a, an inward desire to be sanctified, to be glorified, to be Christ-like. We pursue holiness. There's a, there's a power 
by the Spirit of God and the new nature that we receive at salvation that drives us to change. Some weeks ago, one of our church members called me and he said, Doug, my mom and my stepfather are having serious, serious marriage, marital problems. He said, they're willing to meet with you if you are willing to meet with them. And I was more than happy to do that. They did not go to our church. In fact, the stepfather was an unbeliever. The mother professed to be a Christian. And anyway, they came to see me one night. And I asked him what the problems were. And it was pretty ugly. And, and, and the wife said, that one of the biggest problems is my husband is an alcoholic. And because of that, we have all other kinds of problems in our marriage. And so I asked this man, I said, uh, at one point, I said, I want to ask you something. I said, do you think that you have a disease? Or do you think that you have a, a sin problem, a behavior problem? And he said, well, I don't think it's a disease. And I said, well, I'm really glad to hear you say that. I said, because if what you have is a disease, I can't help you. I don't have any medication to offer you. I don't know of any cure for that disease. I said, but if you're willing to admit that alcoholism or that drunkenness is a sin, I can help you with that because the Bible covers that. And I took the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And he listened attentively, and I gave him a little book that called Ultimate Questions, a great evangelistic tool. I said, read this this week, and let's meet again next week, and I'll try to answer any questions you have. And we met for about an hour, hour and a half the next week, and you could see the penny starting to drop. And the next week we met, and we met again and, and, and talked about the gospel. And afterward, he sent me this text message, and he said, I want to I thank you for this time you spent with me. I want to thank you for the things you've been showing me. He said, because now I really do know that Jesus is my Savior. And he hasn't touched a drop of alcohol since then. There's a power. He's been delivered from the penalty of his sins, and God is increasingly delivering him from the power and the practice of sin. And that encourages us. Sometimes we, we say, well, I have, a, I have an anger problem. Well, I understand that. Or people say, I have a problem with lust, or, or you name it. And as Christians, if we're not careful, we're defeatist about that. We shouldn't be that. We, need, we should come back to this promise. He will save us from our sins. Not just the penalty of our sins, but the power. Jesus Christ can transform us. I, I, I get it. We won't be perfect in this life. And I get it that the battle is fierce. I've been saved for 35 years, and, and the battle is fierce. But I can look back and see God changing me. Wonderful promise of being delivered from the power of our sins. But thirdly, Jesus also saves us from the, the pleasures of our sin. This is an exhaustive promise. He changes us. I think John Piper said once that God fights our pleasures with new pleasures. He fights pleasure with pleasure. We have these old affections. We love the world. We're told to love not the things of the world. But as hard as we try to love not the things of the world, they're very appealing to us. But there was an 18th or 19th century preacher by the name of Thomas Chalmers who really understood this better than anybody I've ever read. And he preached a sermon called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And in dealing with 1 John chapter 2, he made the, uh, where he talks about love not the world, he made this observation. He said the only way to dispossess the heart of the heart of its old affection is by the expulsive power of a new affection. Let me say that again. The only way to dispossess the heart of its old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. And what he was saying was this. The more that we focus on the gospel and the more that we grow, therefore, in our love for Christ, then the less we love the world, we have a, a new affection that takes over. It's like an oak tree in my yard back in South Africa. And when, it, when the leaves die, they, they hang on all winter long. We don't have quite the winters you do here, but it hangs on all winter long. But, it, but come springtime, they start to fall. And they start to fall because there's a new life now in the branch. And that new life is now starting to come out at the end of the new bud. And it pushes off the old dead life. And one day when I was raking leaves, that dawned on me. That that's really what the Christian life is all about. As we walk with Christ and love him more, this new life pushes out the old. It pushes out the dead. We have a, a change in our affections. One of my, my, my best friends in high school was a, a, a massive guy. He was 6'2 and 220 pounds. He was an all-American tight end for our, 
our, our high school. I was saying last hour that I've always been very small, but I've always been very smart. I picked the oldest, the biggest guys to be my friends. And we were very, became very good friends, and we both went away to, he went to the University of Maryland, and I went away. And while I was away, the Lord saved me, and we came back, and we saw each other at a, at a get-together um, that summer. And Bill said, hey, Doug, we're all going downtown Cincinnati to the bars. Let's, let's go. And I said, Bill, I'm not going to go. And he said, why not? I said, well, Bill, I, my life's changed. I don't do that anymore. And he said, well, tell me about it. And I, and I briefly told him what the Lord had done. And Bill literally picked me up and put me in his car. He said, you're going with me. So we went down and, and, uh, and, and we sat at this bar and he was drinking whatever. And I had my Coke and I shared the gospel with him. Another friend of mine had gotten saved that year. He shared the gospel with Bill that summer. Bill goes back to university to play football. And uh, he meets this guy who's 100 pounds. He's a gymnast. And this guy is just tenacious. He won't let go of Bill, and he keeps preaching the gospel to Bill. Well, one day, Bill calls me. Bill's been saved. And his life was so transformed. And we came back the next summer we were together, and he goes back for his third year, I guess, at university. And he called me one day, and he said, Doug, he said, I've made a decision. He said, I- I've quit the football team. Now, Bill wanted to be a professional football player and he was well on his way towards that I said why are you doing that he said because since I've come back here he said I'm not doing well spiritually he said I can't find a church that's helping me he said I'm coming back to get involved in my church and he went to the University of Cincinnati and he got involved in his local church make a long story short God just so grabbed a hold of him that no longer was he loving football and he became, some, some years later, became the president of Athletes in Action here in the United States. And now he's pastoring a church uh, out, out west. But here's a man whose his, his passion was football for all the time that I knew him. But once the Lord saved him, there was a new affection. The Lord does that. He changes us. He changes our appetites. He changes our affections. Jesus Christ will save us from the penalty and the power and from the pleasures of sin. But he also will save us from the presence of sin. My father, who is 86 years of age, just turned 86, uh, has been diagnosed with uh, dementia in early stages of, of Alzheimer. And he's been doing pretty well lately. And I talked to him a few weeks ago, and, and, and we had a nice conversation. But uh, this past week, he's taken a real turn for the worse. And I, I'm actually flying to Atlanta tomorrow to, to, to be with them. And on Tuesday, I'll help my mom put my dad in a, in a nursing home. And my mom said to me the other day, she said, you know, barring a miracle, your dad's never going never gonna to be home again. He's in really bad shape. And as sad as that is, you know what's glorious? I know my dad loves Christ. My dad was saved by the gospel. In fact, when my mom was expecting me, my mom and dad were both converted. My dad has a testimony of loving Christ. He has a testimony of the gospel. And I know one day my dad's going to have a glorified body. The older I get, the more I appreciate that reality. One day, completely, you know, I have five daughters, and so there were lots of TV shows I was exposed to, like Extreme Makeovers. And you just see this incredible transformation job taking place. But that has nothing, that doesn't hold a candle to what Christ is going to do for us one day. Glorified. He's going to completely save us from our sins. I love the Christmas carol when it says that his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And one day, this this is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to have glorified bodies. And there's going to be no more battling with sin. None of that complete glory. That's a promise to live by. This promise is exhaustive. It's also very expansive. And what I mean by that is this. That when God saves us, he oftentimes saves other things as well. I see this says 1141. I'm just wondering what time zone that is. I never noticed. According to my time zone, I have several hours left. So <laughs> you should have stipulated that. But it's expansive. You know, you talk about, we talk about collateral damage in warfare. But when it comes to the gospel, there's collateral blessings. That when God saves sinners he often saves other things he saves marriages sometimes he saves families and i have a dear friend name is jim and 25 years ago i met jim he was a an atheist his wife was a faithful member of the church that at that time i was co-pastoring and she told me about him she said doug i really need you to go see him and try to bring the gospel to him she said but i warn you he he throws pastors out of the house 
He doesn't like pastors. He's, a, he's an angry man. He's an angry atheist. But one night I went to visit him and sat down with him. We spent an hour and a half together in his home. And at the end of the night, he said, he said you know, Doug, he said, I, I kind of like you. He said, uh, in fact, he, call, I don't, he called me Padre. He said, hey, Padre. He said, I, I kind of like you. He said, so you can come to my house anytime. I said, but don't talk about God. I said, fair enough. It's your house, your rules. So I'd go to his house, and I wouldn't bring up God, but he would. And he would get mad, and he'd throw me out, literally. And that went on for a long time. And um, one day I, um, I, I called Jim, and I said, we're having a special service at our church. And I said, I thought I'd just take this chance. I said, would, would, would you come to our church? And he said to me, I'd love to. And I was shocked because earlier he had said to me that I would be pregnant before he would ever come to our church. <laughs> so he was pretty opposed to it. But anyway, he sat through this message, Matthew 19. I'll never forget he sat on the right side and I looked over here and preached to him, okay? <laughs> and I preached from Matthew 19 about the rich young ruler and, and afterwards he was, a, he was a different man. His wife called me and she said, Doug, what's happened? She said, I, she said, this man is different. And he was on his way to Zimbabwe that day on a business trip. His wife had put a Bible in there that six months earlier she'd asked me to sign. Because she said, I believe God's going to save my husband. And I'd signed it, welcome to the family of God. He gets to Zimbabwe, opens the suitcase. There's a Bible there. He's reading it. And God gives him assurance of salvation. But up until that time, Jim was a, and he'd tell you this. He was a, he was a, he was a terrible husband. He was an angry man. There was, there was heartache in that home. But you know what? After God saved him, God saved that home. God saved that marriage. And I was pleased. My wife and I were at their 35th wedding anniversary where Jim, Jim said, you know, for years I didn't treat my wife right, but God has saved me. And he said, I just want to demonstrate my love for my wife and, and my appreciation for her. And he got down on his knees and washed her feet. It was so moving. That's what the gospel does. The gospel is expansive. It saves us from our sins and it also saves other things. It, it saves nations. I, the nation of Zambia is a bright spot in, in Africa. And it's because of the gospel. David Livingston, when he died, he had, he had a handful of converts. But some of the best churches in, in Africa are there in Zambia. Some of the strongest churches. The gospel is affecting the government there. The gospel makes a difference. The gospel, the, 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 the collateral blessings make a difference. And I believe this. That as we in our local churches become more and more consumed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we become more and more consumed with him, that we change, and then our churches change. And rather than criticizing all the problems and wanting to leave, we become a stronger community of faith, realizing we're in this race together. And therefore, we preach this gospel to ourselves. And when others fail us, we don't just sit around and condemn them. We, we go to them, and we speak to them, and we proclaim the gospel to them. And they ask for forgiveness, and we forgive them. And we practice that gospel truth. And as we do that, our churches are saved. Our churches are increasingly sanctified. So this promise is exhaustive, and it's expansive. It's extensive. I love this where it says that you'll call his name Jesus and literally it reads this way, for he it is who will save his people from their sins. As though Matthew was, uh, was writing these words of the angel saying, listen, he it is. There's no other savior. There, there, there's one and he's going to save his people, all of his people from all of their sins. You know, sometimes we can hear gospel testimonies and we can hear from believers about how God is working their life and changing. And we can sit back and think to ourselves, I wish I was experiencing that. You can if you're one of his people. Because this gospel promise isn't just for some super group of saints. It's for every one of us. Everyone who is his people. Everyone who realizes that they're sinners who need a savior. And they realize their only hope is Christ. And they call to him for salvation. They are forgiven of the penalty of their sin. But also everything we've looked at the, the, from the power of sin. This is an extensive promise that he will save all of his people from all all of their sins. And I simply want to say this, that this extents, the extent of this promise is really the extent of our mission. That's why the church has been left here. Because his people are not just in Washington, Illinois. 
They're not just in Brackenhurst, South Africa. They are in all the nations of the world. Amongst the 11,000 people groups, God has his people. And I believe that the, the more that we embrace this gospel promise and love the gospel, the more we're willing to sacrifice to reach those people with the gospel. Years ago, we sent one of our families, he was an elder at the time, we sent him to Ethiopia as a missionary. After some years, uh, the door opened to go to Somaliland, which is a, a north, just north of Somalia. And uh, I went with Francois on a survey trip as we were kind of making plans strategically how to get him in there. We went to the capital city of Hargeisa. And as we were driving around, Francois pointed to a grocery store. He said there were some missionaries coming out of that store and they were assassinated. We drove some time later by a home. He said there were missionaries from the UK who were sitting in their lounge and they were assassinated. And he told all these stories about missionaries who had lost their lives there. And Francois had three small boys at that time, he and his wife, Shelley. And, and, and we talked about that. He said, Doug, we've, we've prepared our boys for this. We've talked about the fact that we might actually die for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what would make a person do that? Somebody who believes this gospel. Somebody who believes that Jesus will save all of his people from all of their sins. And a person who believes that some of those people are in Somalia land and need to be reached with the gospel. The gospel is, what, is our own love for Christ and his gospel is what drives us to sacrifice all for him. This promise is exclusive. It's about he and he alone who will save his people from their sins. But I want to share this with you and I'm winding this down. This promise is expensive. It's expensive. Anselm said, an early church father, the debt was so great that while a man alone owed it, only God could pay it. He, he it is alone who will save his people from their sins, but there's a price involved in that. The apostle Paul wrote about Christ who has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. When Jesus hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was abandoned by God because he was accursed by God for his people. R.C. Sproul said it this way. He said that Jesus must not only be executed by man, but he must be abandoned by God. And at the very essence of the cross, was the utter forsakenness of Christ. Sproul goes on and says that we must be careful that we don't adopt the idea that Jesus just felt like he was forsaken by the Father. He actually was forsaken by the Father because he became a curse for us. And I don't have time to develop this, but in Deuteronomy chapter 27, read it this afternoon, verses 11 and following, where you had half the tribes on Mount Gerizim and half the tribes on Mount Ebal. And one side would pronounce the cursings for those who disobeyed the law. And the other side would pronounce the blessing. And the Levites would proclaim the law and they'd say things like, cursed is everyone who worships an idol. And cursed is everyone who moves his, la his neighbor's landmark. And cursed is everyone who mistreats his mother and father. And cursed is he who sleeps with his father's wife. And cursed is he who lies with an animal. And you go through all this list of all these gross sins. And, and the other side would say, amen, we agree with that. Cursed be those who do that. When you read Galatians 3 about Christ becoming a curse for us, we need to realize that when Christ hung on the, on the cross, he really was being a curse of God for all those vile sins. He who was sinless, righteous, perfectly holy, the Lamb of God without spot or blemish, he who was sinless became sin in our place. That is unfathomable. He was cursed for us. This, the expense of this promise. When you consider the expense of the promise, we should not be surprised by it being so exhaustive and by, by it being so expansive and by it being so extensive or why it's so exclusive. There was only one who could pay that price and thank God he paid it. And the empty tomb that we recently celebrated Easter, and we should celebrate every Lord's Day, the empty tomb proves the price was paid. Let me bring this to a close. 
Look at the last verses of Matthew, 20, Matthew 1. In verse 22, after the angel says this to Joseph, after, if I could put it this way, after the angel preaches the gospel to Joseph, it says, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name G- Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So it's a scriptural promise, but look at this. Then Joseph, if I can paraphrase, then Joseph, after hearing the gospel message from this angel, then Joseph, after hearing this gospel, being aroused from sleep, did, he did, as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took to him his wife. He did not know her. He exercised self-control. He did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Things have not changed circumstantially one bit. Everybody believes that Joseph and Mary, that, that, that Mary is carrying an illegitimate child. There's no doubt that people were going to criticize Joseph and say, why didn't you abandon her? For all their lives, they would live under the shadow of people slandering them and slandering their son. But in spite of that, after he hears the gospel, he says, I now have a change in direction. I was going to put her away, but I've now heard the gospel, and now I'm willing to openly identify with Jesus. And when Jesus was born, what does he do? He obeys the word of that angel, and he calls his name Jesus, Jehovah's salvation. Can you imagine how ridiculous that would have seen, seemed in the society when people say, what's the name of your, and they might be thinking, illegitimate son. And Joseph would say with great pride, pride his name is Jehovah's salvation. <laughs> his name is, he's the Messiah. This is Jehovah's salvation. He openly identified. He did the hard thing in a culture of disbelief because he believed this gospel. What am I saying? I'm saying simply this. We face difficulties in our life. We face a hostile society when it comes to the gospel. And and I read the news every day and I read what's happening in in America. And and, and it seems to be a mess here, to be quite frank. And and you see a, a culture that becomes more and more hostile to the gospel and to the church. South Africa, it's getting worse as well. But you know what I believe? I believe this is a gospel to to, to live, this is a promise to live by. And because I believe this gospel, I can get up in the morning and I can say, you know what? Even though things look dark, you know what? This is truth. I can live by this. I I can preach this gospel to myself when I fail. I can preach this gospel to my fellow church members and to my family members when they fail. I can give them hope, and I can have hope in this day, in this culture, because Jesus Christ is indeed the one who saves us from our sins. The gospel gives us hope. We sung about it this morning. It gives us hope. Dear people, brother and sister in Christ, learn to preach this gospel to yourself every day. It's not the A, B, and C's. It's the A to Z of the Christian life. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the gospel. The gospel of God. Someone said it's a message that no man would think of if he could. No man could think of if he would. We thank you that this gospel of God concerning your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life, who died for our sins and who was vindicated by the resurrection from the dead. Thank you that, Jesus, you live seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ today that you would help them, those who are discouraged, to find great joy, encouragement, and hope in the gospel afresh today. Those in this room that have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, may today be the day where you open their eyes They believe the gospel and for the first time realize they're one of his people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.